In 2019, over a million hectares of peatland burned in Indonesia, creating a fire crisis not seen since 2015, which Indonesian President Joko Widodo had established a peatland restoration agency in 2016 in order to address. Formerly called the BRG, this agency set a goal to restore 2.6 million hectares of peatland by the end of 2020. That goal has not been achieved, so the government has now extended the mandate to 2024, incorporating a mangrove restoration target and revising the name of the agency to the BRGM. My name is Mike DiGirolamo, your host from Mongabay Explorers, a special podcast series from Mongabay.com's global team, where I speak with experts from the field working to protect the critically threatened forests and animals of Sumatra. Join me bi-weekly as I dive into the unique beauty and key issues of this one-of-a-kind landscape and the people working to protect it. This week, I spoke with Budi Wardhana, Deputy Head of Agency at the BRGM, the National Peatland Restoration Agency in Indonesia, and Dia Puspitaloka, a researcher of the value chain finance and investment team at C4, the Center for International Forestry Research. I spoke with Budi and Dia about the importance of peatland to Indonesia and Sumatra, how it degrades, the dangers it poses when it catches fire, pathways to restoring it, and challenges and roadblocks to achieving the goals both C4 and the BRGM are working to achieve. 1.2 million hectares of peatland still remain to be restored, as well as an additional 600,000 hectares of mangrove, and peatland fires are dangerously toxic and very difficult to contain. Not to mention, the peat in Indonesia contains nearly 57 gigatons of carbon dioxide. Despite legislative roadblocks, high stakes, and an ambitious time frame, both Budi and Dia were optimistic that with buy-in from local communities and governments, these goals could be achieved in the near future. I'm Dia. I work at C4 for the Value Chains Finance and Investment Team. We do participatory action research to community-based fire prevention and pitland restoration and community-based business model. So peat is partially decomposed organic material uh, that form under saturated water condition. So there are various remains of plants, branches, and leaves, and peat itself holds the functions as terrestrial carbon pool and carbon sink. It is estimated that there were only 3% of peatland in the Earth's surface, but it contains more than 550 gigatons of carbon. So it is very important. And in the humid tropic, peatland ecosystem contain 10 times more carbon compared to other peatland ecosystems, for example, the boreal and subpolar ecosystem. And Indonesia itself is the largest contributor in Southeast Asia and the second largest in the world after Brazil. But the most, most of the peatland are degraded. So restorations of the peatland is one of the cost effective and efficient way to bring back and generate uh, more carbon. In addition to holding many tons of carbon, peatlands provide a significant source of food, water, and shelter to local megafauna and communities that inhabit them. The degradation of peat soil harms peatland ecosystems, wildlife, and people alike. Peat is comprised three things. First, the peat soil itself, and then it's about the soil. The carbon-rich soil that it is composed by the biomass that is not uh, totally decomposed because the situation is flooded uh, frequently, so it could not uh, decompose totally. So it become uh, pit soils. Pitland, uh, in another sense, is a landscape. A landscape that covers uh, pit and another component there. Uh, it might be a mineral soil, which is influenced by the peatland or being influenced by the peatland. The third term is the peatland ecology or the peatland ecosystems. It comprises the peatland, the forests, and all the things that live within it. And of the nearly 15 million hectares of peatlands in Indonesia, Sumatra has around 40% of them. So Indonesia has approximately nearly 15 million hectares of peatland. And in Sumatra, there were about a little over 40% in Sumatra, and the remaining are in Kalimantan and Papua. There are four key functions of peatlands that Budi outlines that are vital to Indonesia. 
The most important of these, he says, is the regulation of water and carbon storage, which as evidenced by how much carbon they contain, is vital to climate change mitigation and adaptation. First, it gives and regulate uh, water. It also provides uh, fiber, provide food, provide habitat. The third is because it is regulated the uh, microclimate because it's absorbed the uh, carbon dioxide. It's also uh, stored the excessive uh, carbon, uh, stored the uh, biomass that it is uh, died but not decomposed. And uh, the fourth is about the culture. So a lot of uh, people in Indonesia uh, traditionally live within and in the vicinity of the speed land. They grow, uh, they have uh, cultures that sometimes based on uh, the way that uh, they deal, they uh, interact with the peat land. So that's the, the functions. Uh, among the four of the functions, the uh, issues on uh, water regulations and climate change mitigation and adaptations is the most uh, important part. It, it is as a uh, carbon storage that is that has uh, meaningful not only for Indonesia but uh, globally. The peat soil can hold up to ten times the amount of carbon as the vegetation that grows on it. So when the soil is degraded and drained of water, it becomes a tinderbox for haze and massive amounts of carbon emissions. Because of this, the Indonesian government made protecting and restoring these peatlands an issue of national concern following a swath of devastating peat fires in the year 2015. The government put priority on the peatland restorations because back to the years before, decade before, as you also know that it has become a global concern in the south in the year 2015. There's a huge uh, forest and land fire, and the uh, huge areas of peatland is burned. When peat soil catches fire, it not only burns the vegetation on top, but also up to one meter below the surface making efforts to contain it incredibly difficult. At the same time, it releases significant amounts of particulate matter into the atmosphere, jeopardizing the communities that breathe in this air and communities across the border to neighboring countries. Compared to the forests and the biomass that grows over the mineral soil, when it is burned, it is quite easily to manage to put the fire off. But in the, on the peatland, it's a different story because the, the fire not only burned the, the biomass above the ground, but it is also could burn the peat soil itself until the depth of one meter. So it's one meter depth, so it's, 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 it's fire and because the conditions of those uh, biomass, it's uh, humid, it's uh, moist. So the... The, the volume of the smoke and the pollutant, the PM10 uh, and PM2.5 uh, micros is going up and it, it could be blown by the wind. So uh, the impact of the speed fire is quite huge in terms of the time, the period of, of the fire and also the impact to the health of the people surrounding and even uh, across the border uh, to the neighboring countries. So why it's become uh, important and the government put so much effort in dealing with the uh, restorations. So how do waterlogged peatlands catch fire? Well, the process begins when industrial agricultural conglomerates run out of mineral soil to plant their monoculture crops on. So they turn to peatlands, building canals to drain water from them, thereby drying them out, and they use fire to actually clear the landscape of vegetation as it is cheaper than doing it manually. There's a scarcity of available land for the cultivation, population growth, and also the industrial plantations as palm oil and uh, timber concessions for pulp and paper. They are looking for the available land. They, they first looking for the land which is uh, on the uh, mineral soil, 
But uh, unfortunately, the land on the mineral soil has become scarce. And then uh, they go to the mostly unsuitable land. And then uh, as pitland also is actually it's uh, unsuitable land because uh, it's waterlogged. It's poor in the nutrient, but then uh, for uh, to make those uh, land arable, so they build uh, canals. They build the drainage uh, system to reduce the content of the water, to to reduce the water lock. So by draining the peatland, actually it uh, makes the uh, peat soil dry. It is biomass. So you you can uh, imagine that if those uh, peat soil, the huge peat soil being dry, being drained, then uh, you will have uh, a lot of fuels. If incidentally or even by the act of the most efficient way of uh, people clearing the land and they use fire, so then the, the, the uh, pit it's burned. It's not only the, the vegetations uh, above the pit land, but also the pit land itself. So the, the drainage uh, makes the pit land susceptible to fire, and the uh, drainage also uh, make the pit land actually not uh, suitable anymore for anything. Because when it's uh, when when the pit land is gone, it's become subsidized. And then uh, the, the land that uh, previously pit land, the, the shape of the landscape is become like bowl. So when the uh, rainy seasons, instead of fire, you have flood. Sumatra itself has 6.5 million hectares of Indonesia's peatlands, the most of which are in the province of Riau, more than half of which are degraded, totaling 2.1 million hectares. The conditions in uh, Sumatra, the province that has the, the most uh, peatland is in Riau. It has the 3.8 million hectares. In Riau, the peatland which is in the good conditions, still in the good condition, is only uh, 1.6 million hectares. From 3.8, 1.6 is in good conditions. The degraded peatland in Riau actually is uh, 2.1 million hectares. More than half uh, of the uh, peatland in Riau uh, is already degraded. But in terms overall in Sumatra, around 54% is degraded. What we have in here, uh, the president only give us three uh, provinces in uh, Sumatra, which has the most peatland. So our focus as the peatland restoration agency only on three provinces, the uh, Riau, the Jambi provinces, and the South Sumatra province. Because the three provinces comprise of 90% of the whole Sumatra. Restoring peat is no easy task, and Dia explains that in order to restore it, addressing the anthropogenic pressures that lead to peat degradation is essential. Similarly to rainforest restoration efforts, creating community incentive with local government buy-in is key. So in the global level, ecological um, restoration is the process of assisting the recovery of degraded and damaged ecosystem. But uh, in peatland restorations, it's similar. But in Indonesia, we have a very unique and specific approach uh, toward restorations. And it is uh, involving to address the human um, activities that are the drivers of a peatland degradation. There are various studies mentioned that peatland degradation driven by logging, land conversion, and constructions of artificial uh, drainage, uh, farming practices that is not sustainable in addition to the recurring fire. So um, Indonesia itself lies in a very um, unique socio-ecological system. And 
it has to have a unique um, approach. And to respond with that, the Indonesia Taylor approach by incorporating to 3R restoration, that is rewetting, revegetations, and revitalizations of uh, livelihood. And the process itself also includes uh, the free prior and informed consent to obtain the community consents on constructions of restoration facility and also specific innovations tailored to reduce the anthropogenic uh, pressures. And this is actually highly appropriate because the anthropogenic or human pressures is high. And in order for uh, restorations to be successful and sustained until the pitland is fully restored, it has to have the buy-in from the local government and most importantly from the local community. And the people should and are the forefront of uh, restoration. In terms of restoring peatland on monoculture concessions, the process is complex and complicated by the length of concession permits of existing plantations and the level of dryness and degradation in the peat soil itself. The Indonesian government has put a moratorium on new concessions, but they have not revoked licenses for any existing plantations. So they have set requirements for water levels in existing peatlands for current occupants until their licenses expire. First of all, when you deal with the peatland, the most profile of the peatland, the characteristic of peatland is on the water. Because in the ecological system, peatland is also belong to the wetland uh, ecosystem. A character is defined by the uh, conditions of the water within the peatland. Uh, when we have to restore the degraded peatland, first of all, we need to restore the hydrological system of the peatland. We should close the drainage or we should carefully manage if the drainage is still required. If the drainage system uh, is happened on the protected peatland, we totally covering it up. We close uh, the, uh, the canals. We close the uh, drainage system set on those protected peatland. But in an, in another hands, if the canal system, if the drainage system is on the cultivable land, the land that is allowable for the cultivation, uh, we put the restrictions on the amount of water that could flow out from the pit area. So we do the canal blocking and a strict uh, water management in those uh, cultivation area. The second approach that it is uh, implemented by the government is if the plan is still suitable in the wet condition of peatland, it is still allowable to grow those uh, for the purpose of the economic productions. But if it is not, you still could grow the commodities. Uh, you, you still could grow the, for instance, the palm oil until you expire the license. But for the time being, uh, you need to carefully uh, manage the uh, water within the concession areas. The government put a strict requirements for those concession holders to keep the water table not below the uh, 40 centimeters. If the water table in the concessions is less than, uh, is, is, is deeper than uh, 40 centimeters, it becomes susceptible to fire. So the, the government will control and the concessions shall report to the government every two weeks. Whenever uh, there's uh, uh, indications that a water table is uh, lower than uh, 40 centimeters, uh, they have to, to uh, do the response to increase the water table until they expire the license. When a plantation's license expires, they are then required to give the peatland back to the government, which will plant trees that can withstand the water table of the soil. And the process to restoring the peatland fully from here could take decades. When they expire the license, they should give the land back to the government and the government will revisit the area with the uh, trees that 
uh, could withstand the uh, high water table, which is uh, suitable for the peatland conditions. How long? The restorations, uh, the restorations for the hydrology uh, takes about uh, five to ten years to, to be able to increase the wetness of the peatlands. While in total, after five or ten years, we could start the revegetations of the, the degraded uh, peatland, which already been improved the uh, hydrological conditions. And how long does it took? It's sometimes 75 years and more. Budi cited examples in Finland and Japan where restoration efforts took around 25 years to get the ecosystem back to viable conditions where it could withstand the dry season. Dia echoed his sentiments and added that depending on the severity of the degradation, restoration timeframes could vary widely. Obviously, depending on the level of severity of the pitland. And in, in the end, there is a theory that peatland may go irreversible uh, degradation when it's being exposed f- uh, for the sun and being dry for over a long period of time. So in that case, when irreversible uh, degradation or drying occurs, we the restoration should create like environment or condition that support for new pits to accumulate. Unfortunately, the rate of pit accumulations is very slow. It is estimated about 1.3 millimeter uh, annually under a, a supportive condition, according to the studies. Complicating the situation further is the length of time that concession permits last. Booty says that many of them have been given out as recently as a couple of decades ago, and they last at minimum around 35 to 75 years before the government can take the land back. The license has only been given a couple of years ago, a couple of decades ago. While the concessions uh, license, in minimum, could last 35 to 75 years. It depends on the area. So what we have uh, currently is to stop all the licensing of the pitland. So the president is uh, the president has already uh, enacted a moratorium on the uh, pitland conversion and also pitland uh, licensing. So there will be no more uh, conversions of pitland into the plantations, into the forest industries, and so on and so forth. But uh, the the one that already been given, we have to wait until the license uh, is expired. So we did so, so the, the government could reclaim uh, the area So one might wonder, what goals could be achieved in only four years' time? Well, C4 is working on participatory action research with community-based land restoration models focused on behavioral change. Rather than using fire for land clearing in farming practices and land preparation, C4 is working to help the government find ways to fast-track land restoration with sustainable business models using agroforestry with pineapples and ecotourism pilot programs. So C4, as a research institution, we are carrying out a participatory action research that is a transdisciplinary and uh, includes um, process to foster transfer of knowledge, particularly scientific knowledge and um, local or global wisdom. And with the community being positioned as the partner of the research instead of a subject. For us, research institutions such as C4, it is an effective way for us to engage, contribute, and create immediate impact on the ground. That is also a response uh, for the urgent call to generate impact on the ground. So the PAR project um, on community-based pitland restorations aim to support a gradual change of behavior for local community for not using fire in land preparation uh, since there has been a government call on zero burn program that left the community uh, that using fire in farming 
with my choice but to comply and look for alternative for land preparations and we also want to support the government program on mainstreaming uh, pitland restoration so we carried out the research activities led by c4 scientist professor harry pornomo containing on four phases reflection planning action and monitoring a part of the activities are baseline study and developing testing on the ground land preparations model for land preparation without using fire and sustainable business model that is peat adaptive. One of the examples are the agroforestry of pineapple and also uh, we are planting hardwood trees and piloting ecotourism of uh, native peat fish species. Dia says that preliminary trials of this business model has garnered the interest and support of the local private sector in areas of implementation, and she hopes that it will serve as an example for future endeavors. We carried out and helped the community to facilitate implementing uh, the business model in a real scale plot ranges from 2.2 hectares to 3.6 hectares and to understand the real dynamics beyond a lab scale. So one of the model was um, planting hardwood species and also to um, pilot ecotourism on fish pond that is uh, with native fish uh, pit adaptive ecosystem. So this model carried out by the male farmer groups who are involved in the fire-free suppression team. And so far, there are uh, the private sectors that operate nearby showing a positive contributions by also giving aid to them to support the implementations of this ecotourism business model. This is just a start and we expect contributions from all parties to involve in and engage in these restorations. And we hope that it can be a starting point to show that there is a sustainable business model that we could implement and pilot in the context of restoring pitland. These efforts aren't constrained to pineapple or hardwood only, but can use a variety of other crops, but they are still in their initial stages. However, Dia hopes that the business model can be scaled up and used widely as an alternative to monoculture on peatlands. And to my understanding is that we are trying to introduce that there is an option of sustainable business model to be carried out in peatlands, and those includes agroforestry, either with apples or rubber and um, liberica coffee. And we try to facilitate the community to brainstorm, build, and test their ideas into actual implementations. And it is in the initial um, stage, uh, but some of it has generates and can be harvested. Um, so in the future, we hope that this kind of sustainable business model can be scaled up and out by other local communities. So they have more alternative livelihood that is more sustainable other than monocultures of uh, palm oil. And Dia also believes that the moratorium on new peatland concessions is a chance to evaluate and improve the sustainability of currently existing palm oil concessions with the implementation of this business model. And currently there is a moratorium on peatland, um, which I see to be a very uh, good opportunity for us to evaluate and evaluate the business model that we have and try to leverage um, the existing plantation, for example, by rejuvenations of palm oil, improving the governance of palm oil to be more sustainable, and also to look for other alternatives other than palm oil with a sustainable business model. But restoration efforts expand beyond agroforestry. For example... In central Kalimantan, where there exists carbon sequestration concessions for the carbon trade and restoration concessions in national parks via ecotourism, both, Dia says, were started even before the Indonesian government made restoration a priority. So a part of my thesis is actually to assess uh, for different restoration projects 
in central Kalimantan managed by different proponents. Some of these projects are occurred even before the government has declared the national agenda for peatland restorations. And two of these projects are actually a type of restoration concession that is aimed for carbon trade, and the other ones are in a national park. So Indonesia has a very uh, unique concession license that is ecosystem restoration concession and also carbon stock and carbon sequestration concession. Both are aimed for restoring the ecosystem and also aim for the carbon trade, which I see as a potential compared to the other types of um, concession, for example, because it gives benefit not only for the people, but also for the ecosystem itself by a restoration approach. And in all of these projects, either it's in a national park and also uh, in the concession, those are potentials in carbon market, for example, and also ecotourism. There has been some attempt in the national park in central Kalimantan to develop uh, ecotourism with the community as the driving force. So that is another uh, potential to leverage the ecosystem surfaces of the peatland while we also restoring the ecosystem of the peatland. And as mentioned earlier, the locals become involved in the replanting and rewetting of these peatlands to revitalize their livelihoods away from deleterious methods. So the project facilitated restoration by replanting and also rewetting and revitalizations of the livelihood of the people to reduce the anthropogenic pressures that occur nearby as well as in the concession and in the restoration project itself. And with that, it means it involves activities such as uh, planting and it involves activities such as canal blocking constructions and all being done along with the community. Government and private sector buy-in is imperative, but so is community involvement, which Dia says has been resoundingly positive thus far which Dia says is in large part influenced by the loss of peatlands to fires and the devastating effects of haze. Community buy-ins definitely are increasing, and there are a wide acceptance of uh, peatland restorations because of the work of the national government as well as the subnational government and local government. There are a lot of um, actors working on peatland, not only the government, but also the non-governmental organization, as well as civil society and university to mainstream the idea of peatland. And the people itself, they feel the loss caused by fire and haze occurrence on peatland, especially in the long drought season. So they more familiar with the idea of why restoration is needed. And in addition to that, most of the interventions also involve the FPIC, the free prior and informed consent, to obtain the community consent on the restoration projects that's going on. So this is involved with socializations and educating people on restorations and the benefit is. As mentioned, the BRGM has extended the mandate to include mangrove restoration, which both Dia and Budi say plays a vital role in the national restoration effort, as mangroves, like peat, are carbon-heavy ecosystems, and restoration projects include key areas in Sumatra. So among the, the terrestrial uh, ecosystem in Indonesia, both peatland and mangrove are the rich, carbon-rich ecosystem. So with uh, our efforts in fulfilling the NDC, the National Determined Contribution to reduce the emissions, the two ecosystem is the nature-based most efficient strategy to reduce the emissions, especially from the land-based economy. In Sumatra, we previously worked with the three provinces, as I mentioned before, Riau, Jambi, and the South Sumatra. In addition to that, in Sumatra, we will work in North Sumatra, in the archipelagic of Riau, the Riau Kepulauan, 
and also in uh, the uh, new province of Bangka Belitung. The Bangka Belitung, uh, our focus uh, is on uh, mangrove, while in Kepulauan Rio, we also focus on mangrove, and in Sumatra Utara, we focus on mangrove. Because the three provinces, adding to the other three uh, of peatland, they hold the, the most uh, mangrove ecosystem in Sumatra. Budi and Dia talked about the challenges the BRGM faces in achieving its four-year target. And Budi was quick to mention that the biggest challenges are the fact that restoration efforts currently only target community-managed land, which is what C4's research aids in helping to find alternative land management practices for. And Budi says the government can help investing in these upfront costs. The biggest challenges is, uh, first of all, it's the capacity of the local government. Because uh, nothing that uh, we could do without the support of the local government. The, the other challenge is mostly uh, our target, current uh, target is on the community managed land. For instance, it's for the fisheries in mangrove, and then uh, for the, uh, the plantations of uh, rubber, of palm oil that is managed by the community to ask them to change the way that they do the uh, land management, land clearing is really uh, hard. So we introduced uh, non-fire land clearing or land management uh, for them. It's quite expensive actually, but we could help them with the first investment. We give them the, the money to to invest at the first time to clear the land, which has been uh, planned before, but uh, they need to renew the, the plan. They usually use fire to clear the old plan, and uh, we help them with, with the funding so they are able to clear the land without uh, fire. But eventually, if they see that uh, they can if they can do that and the productivity is, is uh, increasing, they will do themselves. So it's only uh, the, 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 the funding for the first trial for the land clearing. And for the mangrove, uh, we introduced the silpho fisheries. We use the mangrove as the barrier for the pollution uh, from the riverine. We hope that uh, when they grow mangrove surrounding the pond, the fish pond, the, the, the fish uh, can grow well and uh, without additional equipment to put oxygen in the pond. So if they have a good mangrove uh, vegetation in the area of their uh, fisheries, they, they, they could maintain the productivity while the water pollution is avoided because of the uh, Mangroves. But there are also other challenges, like Dia mentions, of making sure local governments, as well as NGOs, are all participating together, making it necessary for everyone to have a hand in helping the restoration efforts. I'm very hopeful that the new restoration scope, uh, target, and time frame to also cover the mangrove. I think both peatland and mangrove are um, important ecosystem that holds carbon and home to biodiversity and provide goods and services for the people and also for the wildlife. But both have been largely converted to other land uses and in a degraded states. So I think with the new um, target, it is an opportunity for all parties to engage and work together. The challenge are if there are not a lot of actors who are participate in restorations, for example. But to my understanding, uh, right now it is quite hopeful. A lot of actors are seems to interest to take part and play their own role. Even we as a research institution, we try to generate impact through the participatory action research. So the actors that I'm speaking of are not only the central or national government, but also the subnational local government, local community, and also civil society organization. In Riau, for example, there are projects facilitated by the local NGOs focusing on mangrove oppressions 
and also project facilitated by company-led program, for example, through the integrated forestry and farming system that some of them are being carried out in the pit-dominated villages. One challenge that Budi and Dia did not talk about was the enactment of a recently passed slate of environmental deregulation known as the Omnibus Law on Job Creation, which Mangabe's Hans Nicholas Young previously reported on. This omnibus law strips away commitments to restore peatland and protect forests. It also facilitates timber extraction in the name of economic recovery, scrapping a requirement for regions to maintain 30% of their watershed or island area as forest area. Another stipulation requires plantation companies to develop 30% of their land within two years, which could compel companies to clear land faster. The law also introduces a policy under which businesses operating illegally in forest areas can continue their activities as long as they get the necessary permits within three years of the law coming into force. In addition to this, the Environment Ministry also recently passed new regulation allowing protected forest areas to be cleared for a new food estate program, which involves putting in millions of hectares of new farmland for staple crops such as rice. Despite these environmental rollbacks, the Indonesian government is well aware of the dangers of peatland fires and the stakes involved. The environmental toll is clear and the damage caused by fire and haze to the health of the general public cannot be understated. So the fire on Pitland is very hard to be extinguished, and it has created uh, premature deaths, economic loss for the people, either for the business or fail to harvest their crops. There has been a lot of devastations on the ground with the recurring fire that occurs due to the degraded pit ecosystem. And... The benefit for the people itself, not only in the form of ecosystem services such as carbon, but also it can provide alternative livelihood, especially when they use the peatland more sustainably and operate under the sustainable uh, business model, for example. With the wildlife, it is obvious that it will provide a habitat for them. In central Kalimantan, I am lucky enough to witness the nest of orangutan at half-restored uh, degraded peatland. It's also the home of eagles, um, hornbills, and also other creature, creatures in peatland ecosystem. So I'm positive that if we can restore uh, the peatland, there will be uh, more uh, biodiversity there in terms of animals as well as plants, but also it could benefit the people too. The effects of inhaling particulate matter from the fires creates direct respiratory health consequences and compounded with the burning of pesticides creates a significant cancer risk and other maladies that can be felt years after the fires. So the pollution from the haze actually is uh, on the solid particles that it is blown up because of fire. It's PM10 and PM2.5 micro because it, if uh, people inhale those, uh, it, it becomes the infectious and the uh, health problem in the respiratory tract of the people. And the, the other uh, problems for the pollutions or for the uh, burning of the peatland, sometimes they use pesticide when they cruise the uh, the commodities of the peatland, and if those uh, pesticide get burned and uh, become the volatile gases, it's also a cancerous particles that uh, people would inhale if those residue from the pesticide uh, going into the respiratory tract. If the haze itself. And the, the amount of the solid particles, the effect on health of the people is direct. But the, the pollutant, uh, as I mentioned before, from the pesticide residues that uh, inhaled by the, uh, the people, uh, it could show the symptoms maybe two, three, until five years after the fire. Even in the years, the, even in the subsequent years, those fire is not happening, but the, the, the first inhalations might stay on the lung, on the, on the respiratory tract, and then the, the symptoms would show uh, two, three, or five years after the, uh, the big fire. 
So it's really uh, a government concern about it. And the haze from the fires affects agricultural yields in neighboring provinces without fires because of the death of pollinators resulting from the haze. Not only that, actually in the agriculture sector, when the fire, the haze occur, the pollinators is affected also. Like the bees, uh, the pollinators, the other pollinators might die out. And then the the agriculture harvest after those incidents really show uh, reductions in the productions of fruit, of horticulture, and uh, the the other agricultural product. It it has been shown in the statistic of agriculture of the six uh, provinces in in Sumatra. Even the one that is not having the forest and land fire on those uh, area. For instance, in in Lampung, in Bengkulu, which has no uh, huge fire, it's still affected by the the, the fires that happens in uh, South Sumatra, in Jambi, in Riau. Dia reiterates that the Indonesian government has made preventing peatland fires in the future a priority. But she also reiterates that engaging all stakeholders in peatland restoration is vital to achieving the goals the government has mandated over the next four years. Taking actions by responding to this fire by doing restorations is the right step and right things to do. And in Indonesia, the government uh, declared the target to restore the 2.5 million hectares of degraded peatland as a part of the efforts to prevent the fire itself. But there are projects which have been carried out even before that. But these national declarations is a good call for uh, restorations and we have to leverage the ex- existing scheme in ecosystem restorations and carbon sequestration program, for example, to drive all stakeholders to participate and contribute in this effort. I think as a research organizations, we have to continue to create impact and on the ground, of course, through the participatory action research. And I'm supportive for the pitland restoration target itself. And I think we have to implement and pilot more uh, sustainable business model at the local uh, community level and facilitate them and to get on board and to mainstream the idea of restoration. I want to thank Dia and Budi for contributing to this episode and for their research and work on restoring and protecting the peatlands of Indonesia. Manga Bay Explorers is an ongoing podcast series diving into environmental stories from around the globe. Be sure to check out the previous episode in this series, which covers the status and whereabouts of the elusive Sumatran rhino. If you enjoyed this show, please tell a friend. That's the best way to help expand our reach and keep growing. Watch for a new edition of Manga Bay Explorers every two weeks in between episodes of our flagship podcast, The Manga Bay Newscast, which you can subscribe to wherever you find podcasts, or download our new app for Apple and Android devices to gain fingertip access to all our new shows and all our previous episodes. Special projects like this are made possible by our Patreon supporters, so please consider becoming a monthly sponsor via our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash manga bay that's patreon.com forward slash manga bay just a dollar per month will help us offset the production costs and hosting fees keep up with all of manga bay's news from nature's front line at manga bay.com or get updates via twitter facebook and instagram where our handle is at manga bay thank you once again and we'll be back soon with another episode of manga bay explorers